Thank you for coming in for this uh, talk today. What I want to go over in the second day of uh, talks is what we refer to as scan negative cauda equina, or this is the non-compressive causes for cauda equina uh, syndrome. And what I'm gonna try and do is start with a basic overview of what we had talked about yesterday, the anatomy of the cauda equina, so we can understand the symptoms. We'll talk about the symptoms, talk about what can cause it. And then we'll focus more specifically on this scan negative uh, group. Finally, completing the talk with a discussion about how do we manage it? What do we do to treat this? So we'll start by saying that I have no conflicts as pertains to uh, this talk. The goals of this talk are listed on this slide. And as I said just a few seconds ago, it is to review the anatomy so that you understand what is cauda equina syndrome. Then after we've done that, let's look at the causes of cauda equina syndrome. And more specifically, we'll hone then in on what is non-compressive or scan negative cauda equina syndrome. Then finally, we'll end uh, the talk with a discussion about how do we treat uh, this uh, non-compressive cauda equina syndrome. Okay, this slide, for those of you that went to my talk yesterday, saw it. And what's really nice about this slide is it shows you the basic anatomy of a lot of the nervous system. We have the brain, you can see the spinal cord in the middle of the slide, and then you can see the person's hand that's being touched by the hot water um, at the, at the, on the left side of the slide. And what we can see <clears throat> is two different nerves. One is the motor nerve, that's the one that is in red that begins up in the cortex with an upper motor nerve. We'll come back to that in another slide. And then the second in the spinal cord, it's synapses. That's where it connects with the lower motor nerve that then goes down the arm. And that's your peripheral nerve, your lower motor nerve. The sensory nerves, you can see sort of in that teal green color that starts in the cortex, goes down through the spinal cord where it synapses with the lower motor nerve again in the spinal cord that extends down that peripheral nerve with the motor nerve heading to the hand. So we have this within the anatomy of the spinal cord, the sensory, the motor, there's also an autonomic component that parallels these two that's involved in bowel, bladder and GI, as well as cardiac uh, symptoms that can be associated with autonomic neuropathies. This is another slide that we went through yesterday, separating out those upper motor neurons. This is looking at the sensory, but it shows you the layout of the brain, the spinal cord, which is all part of the upper motor neurons. And then after it leaves the spinal cord, we have the lower motor neuron. This is the layout of the spine and the innervation. And when we talk about spinal innervations, we talk about the different levels, including the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, and then finally at the bottom is the coccygeal or the tailbone parts. And you can see those with the C, T, L, and S. And the spinal cord itself begins in the cervical region after the brainstem, and then it goes all the way down the spine, but it doesn't go to the end of it. You can see it ending around L1, L2, and below that, is a series of nerves. So if you go back to our slide before where we had the spinal cord and we had the little nerves that were exiting off those, those were the lower motor nerves. That's what we see in the bottom of this slide. And you can see that's where the cauda equina is or the horse's tail. This is an extension after the spinal cord of all the lower motor neurons that are going down the spine, heading out to their different area that they're going to to innervate the body, the different levels of the spine where they exit at. This is a more direct view of that cauda equina area. And you can see the different lumbar vertebrae, the lumbar, the L4, the L5 vertebrae, and we can see the sacral vertebrae and then the coccygeal. And in each one of these, there are specific nerves that exit, but they're all together in that cauda equina. That's the area where cauda equina syndrome, injury to that area can produce the syndrome. And this map is showing us dermatomes. This explains a lot of what we're talking about with cauda equina. You can see the body is organized in these dermatomes with the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, and the sacral. And if you look at the pattern of the lowest nerves, that is the sacral nerves, you can see a saddle type of pattern 
where they're sort of going in the back of the leg, up around the buttocks and down the other leg following that saddle. So when you get entrapment of that cauda equina right down in that lower area where it involves those sacral nerves, you're going to see numbness in this pattern or what we would describe as a saddle anesthesia. Okay, so again, reviewing, what is cauda equina syndrome? It is a loss of function of the nerves in the cauda equina. We just showed you the anatomy where the cauda equina, it's that horse's tail in the bottom. These are all lower motor neurons that are heading out down the legs and you get impairment. Okay. If we want a more specific definition of this, this is something that's used more for research studies. It's the loss of, of the nerves in the cauda equina, but there are two parts to it, dysfunction of mictrition, defecation, and or sexual function. When we talked about the different nerves, I mentioned that there are motor, sensory, and autonomic. This is impacting the ability to urinate, that's the mictration the stool, defecation, and sexual function. So this has a lot of autonomic as well as sensory and motor, and there's no other explanation. That's one of the hallmarks of cauda equina. The other we just mentioned is that altered sensation, the saddle anesthesia. There may be weakness or loss of reflexes that I'll pick up when we do neurologic examination, but one of the keys to it is we're going to see this loss of neurologic function in this saddle anesthesia. How can it present? Well, we gave those basic criteria, but for somebody who's having the symptoms, they will, they can develop back pain. So if it's a large disc or something in that area, it can produce severe back pain. With the mctrician, you can see the bowel, bladder dysfunction, the numbness in the saddle anesthesia, the weakness that can be down the legs, or sexual dysfunction. These are all symptoms that you can experience if you've got cauda equina. You don't have to have all of the symptoms. In fact, if you look at this slide, this is a retrospective chart review where they look back at 75 patients who presented with cauda equina and they looked at what sort of symptoms were present. And so some of the key parts of it, you can see the majority of them had sciatica, the saddle anesthesia, and urinary difficulties. Those were the big three that, and you can see that that fit into that diagnostic criteria. The other ones where we talked about stool, sphincter control, as well as sexual dysfunction were less common. And again, this is that dermatome re-emphasizing that saddle anesthesia pattern that we're talking about that can be a key part when you get uh, some sort of injury to this cauda equina area. All right, next question. What causes cauda equina? We've described it as loss of function, and there are a lot of different things that can cause this. As general groups, we're gonna go through some of these, but spinal, structural, vascular, neoplastic, inflammatory, infectious, there are even iatrogenic, there are medications that can cause it. And of course, trauma can be a factor. So a lot of different things can produce injury to that area of the spine around the cauda equina. This is just a slide. We're gonna pick it apart as we go down through this talk more, but this is just showing you all the different things. So you can see a lot of different things can do this. One cause we refer to is the structural causes. This is the compressive cauda equina syndrome that we're looking at. And what you can see in this slide on the left panel, in panel A, is somebody's spine. And at the top of that little panel A, you can see the spinal column, okay? That's, or you can see the spinal column, but you can see the spinal cord right at the top where it ends. And then if you look, you can see the little tiny nerves that are coming out of that. That's the cauda equina. It's extending down from that L12 area all the way down towards the lower part of the spine. And as we get towards that bottom part where that arrow is, that's L5S1, you can see there's a disc that came out and poked and caused that, which you can see over in B is evidence of where that disc had crushed it, producing the cauda equina syndrome. So this is a compressive, a structural cauda equina because of compression of that. This is something that we'll come back to in a little bit, which is non-compressive. And the difference between this one and that one is we don't have the disc that's poking out. Instead, what you're seeing is those little bright spots along that area where the cauda equina nerves are. 
and you can see those in the middle and that's the enhancement that's happening to the nerves. Enhancement is a way of seeing active inflammation that's going on within the nerves of the cauda equina. So this is actually a form of a non-compressive cauda equina. Again, going back to that map that I'll keep going back to, you can see the damage for both of those, whether it's a disc at that L5-S1 area that came over and poked all the nerves producing the cauda equina, or alternatively, if you've got some sort of inflammatory or infectious process that's just going through and damaging the nerves in the cauda equina. All right. Now let's get a little bit more specific and let's talk about non-compressive cauda equina syndrome. What is that? Well, it's MR negative and symptom positive to put it shortly. So as directly as we can. So we've got cauda equina syndrome that we've defined as impairment of the nerves within the cauda equina. A large portion of them are because of discs or trauma or something structural and we'll go through some of those compressive ones. So the non-compressive cauda equina or the scan negative ones are those that have all of the symptoms that fulfill all of the criteria for cauda equina syndrome, but don't have a structural lesion that we see on MRI. So what is, how do we sort that out? Well, what is step one? Step one, first off, is confirm that it's cauda equina. You've got bladder dysfunction, you've got leg, or you've got leg weakness and numbness is it really cauda equina or is it something else that just looks like a cauda equina and has some of the symptoms and that's one of the first things we're going to need to exclude this gives you a listing of some of the things that can produce this guillain and CIDP are inflammatory neuropathy conditions. Some people have had friends with this or know somebody with this but you're getting inflammation in the peripheral nerves that are in the arms and in the legs, and this is going to be different than cauda equina because it's not going to be disease at just the cauda equina. You can get it at that level, but you get it at other levels. So this is a peripheral nerve disease. Okay, we look at other causes and there are certain medications. We know there are medications that can affect your bowel and bladder function. And if you have take those medications and develop side effects, you can start thinking, oh my, do I have cauda equina syndrome because I've developed the bowel or bladder problems when it's related to a medication. And of course, urologic disorders can do this. And then there are some brain disorders and I've got MSA, which is something called multi-system atrophy. And it's a, not Parkinson's, but it's a variation on Parkinson's where it can produce a lot of these bladder difficulties that can make somebody think, do I have cauda equina? So the first thing you need to do when we're sorting out if somebody has cauda equina syndrome, they come in with this symptoms that make it suspicious of it, but we need to exclude some of the other causes because many of these, such as the guillain CIDP, the medications or the urologic, these may be treatable disorders and we don't have to talk about uh, what's happening with non-compressive cauda equina. Another comment about that, and this is looking at the peripheral neuropathy factor that we're going to look at. Okay. Remember I said cauda equina can, the CIDP and the guillain can be outside of the spinal cord producing it. And what you see here in, these, in this image is three different patterns of neuropathy that would not be cauda equina that would tell us, wait a minute, there's something else going on here. The distal symmetric, the involvement of the legs and the arms, it doesn't have the saddle anesthesia pattern. The mononeuropathy in that middle picture where it's like a carpal tunnel or an ulnar nerve pinched at the leg, this is not producing the saddle anesthesia changes. And these are forms of focal radiculopathies. Vasculitis can produce inflammation in the, in the cauda equina, but it, can, but it also produces inflammation peripherally and that's not quite going to be a cauda equina syndrome if it's inflammation in the legs and down the nerves of the legs or inflammation in the skin or anywhere else and that needs to be addressed as that. And then of course we have generalized polyneuropathies. Diabetics can produce symptoms that may seem like they're cauda equina but in fact it's a polyneuropathy related to the diabetes. So again, back to what we said, these are non-compressive causes for it. So this is separating out the trauma 
and the structural lesions, and we would say good vascular. There are certain cancers that can do this. We'll go through some of that in another slide. And then a big chunk of the non-compressive ones would end up being sort of the inflammatory, infectious, iatrogenic. And then the last group is the idiopathic group, where we look for all of these causes and we still just don't find something. And uh, that would be in the other group. So this is that slide I showed you before. Multiple causes can be playing a role in it. Again, non-compressive cauda equina, MR negative, symptom positive. These are breaking down that slide into some of the compressive ones. We've already talked about that. Lumbosacral disc herniation, spinal stenosis. Uh, so if you have a giant disc that ruptures into the spinal cord, that's the disc herniation. If instead you have chronic arthritis that gradually and slowly narrows down the canal, that's spinal stenosis. And some people, because of other conditions, such as diabetes and a few others, can develop this epidural lipomatosis, where you get these little, uh, there's a little fat that can build up within the spinal canal and can produce some of this. We talk about type potential vascular causes that can produce compression. Again, these are things that are going to be MR positive. If you get a hematoma, which is uh, just blood within the spinal canal, that's going to create a mass that would be just like a disc that can, uh, that can pinch the cauda equina. If you get aortic disease, a dissection or an aneurysm in the aorta, sometimes this is not going to be compressive, but you can get an infarction to the nerves that provide the cauda equina. And lastly is something called an arterial venous fistula. This is an abnormal collection of blood vessels that connect from the arteries to the veins. And if that's present in the dural and it can grow and become a mass like a, a mass like the hematoma, like a structural lesion that can go in and pinch the cauda equina and produce those sort of symptoms. But these are all compressive type of lesions. The last compressive group, we've got a listing of different types of tumors that can happen. But these are, again, all going to be seen on the scans. We're going to be able to see there is this tumor, whether it's metastatic or a lymphoma or any of these other sarcomas or neurofibromas. We're going to be able to see these on the scan producing compression on the cauda equina. These are not disc or trauma related. These are other causes that might be scan positive. Now we're going to go on to the non-compressive causes. What can do that? Well, non-compressive cauda equina, again, it's scan negative. What's going to happen with this is you've got some sort of inflammation that's coming in that's at the nerve level that's disrupting the way the nerves are functioning. Sarcoidosis is one of them that typically can do this. Sarcoid typically presents with lung disease, but it can produce these what we call granulomas are these nodules that can be present anywhere in the body. And if that inflammation is occurring in the peripheral nerves of the cauda equina, in fact, that slide, which I will show you again, is from somebody who had sarcoidosis. CIDP and Guillain-Barre, I mentioned as a non-compressive cauda equina, that's more of a peripheral nerve, but you can get CIDP and Guillain-Barre involvement of the cauda equina area. So it's important to think about, but that's a little bit of a different disease than cauda equina syndrome. And chronic immune sensory polyradiculopathy is another one of these inflammatory conditions where you get uh, the immune system is attacking the sensory nerves and the motor nerves. AIDP is Guillain-Barre, vasculitis, ankylosing spondylitis and graft versus host disease, all of these, what, one of the things they have in common is the active inflammation that can go in and attack the equina area. I mentioned that patient that I've already shown you once and I'm showing you again, this is somebody who actually had sarcoid disease. And what you can see if you look closely along, not the vertebrae, but just to the back of the vertebrae. So just to the right of the vertebrae, you see those little starfield spots. And those are all the little granulomas from the sarcoid that are lighting up with contrast because of the active inflammation that's going on within them. And this is somebody who doesn't have a disc, so they don't have a compressive. They may be scan negative because nobody did a contrasted scan. The, if you did this contrasted scan, like looking here with the MRI, all of a sudden you, you will see things that you may have missed on a regular scan. I mentioned there could be infectious causes, and this could be an abscess, which you'll see on an MRI, 
but an abscess can produce it. Lyme disease, HSV2, cytomegalovirus, varicella zoster, HIV, these are all viruses that can produce an inflammatory response within the spinal canal, and if it's attacking the nerves of the cauda equina, it can produce cauda equina syndrome. We've also got other things like syphilis, Epstein-Barr virus, cystosarcosis, schistosomiasis. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's fungal infections with cryptococcosis, no cardiosis. So, and we've got a lot of different rare, very rare, let's emphasize this, very rare, but there are infectious causes that can produce that inflammation and cause a non-compressive cardiac syndrome. We also talk about, I mentioned the I iatrogenic causes of this. If you've had cancer, sometimes radiation to that area can produce scarring and inflammation that can impact the cauda equina. Arachnoiditis is also that. This is a not, it's a inf non-infectious cause where you get inflammation and scarring of the nerves within the cauda equina. This can happen sometimes after uh, different treatments that are that uh, that somebody will go through. It can cause this inflammatory reaction, and that'll produce this arachnoiditis. We also look at certain I mentioned medications. Well, cytorabine and methotrexate, chemotherapy medications, they can run the risk of producing this inflammation in cauda equina. And finally, a complication of spinal anesthesia can sometimes happen if something gets injected a little bit differently than it should, it can produce some cauda equina symptoms. Lastly, let's talk about that other or idiopathic type of group. Uh, certainly trauma is kind of in the other group, but uh, these extra medullary hematopoiesis, this is if you're just, if your body is just making uh, blood cells in the wrong place, it's going to be. But what I wanna include that isn't in here is the idiopathic group. Um, where we haven't exactly identified a cause, it is probably an undefined viral cause, but some patients will develop it despite everything being negative. Scan may be negative, but they still got caught at quina. So backing up and summarizing what is caught at quina syndrome, it is the loss of function of the peripheral nerves in the caught at quina. Multiple causes, multiple symptoms. We mentioned the back pain, the bowel and bladder dysfunction, the typical symptoms that you can see with this, and how do you manage it? It's our last section of this talk. How do we manage cauda equina syndrome? Well, the first thing you need to do is identify the cause, okay? You need to, if you can find an inflammatory cause, you need medications directed at that inflammatory cause of the non-compressive cauda equina. If it's a medication that caused the toxicity, you need to stop that medication. So identifying the cause and going through that question of which one of those is it that I listed is going to be critical to identifying it. Once you have identified the cause, you can then try to treat that cause and hopefully get the symptoms better. You can then start medications to address the symptoms. And we may go through a little bit of that, but these are medications that may try to quiet down the bowel or the bladder symptoms, or in fact, the mu if there's muscle pains that's going on with this, trying to address the pain that goes with it. But a big part of, of managing cauda equina syndrome in the chronic part is therapy and lifestyle. Trying to get the muscles and nerves to function better. This is for the, both the bowel, the bladder, the legs, just trying to improve and promote recovery from this is going to be key in the long-term management of Cochlea syndrome. So there are no specific cures, but there are treatments, medication, therapy, and lifestyle, and there are ways we can intervene. And I like to show this slide because this shows you the best, best way when you're into that chronic cauda equina. This is greater than six months of cauda equina. You've worked up all the causes. It's all been negative, but you've still got symptoms. How are you going to manage it? And I like this slide because it emphasizes the importance of you being in the center and your specialists being out on the, on, on the side helping you to guide this to guide your care. And you can see you're the person in the center, your care partner is the person who's there guiding you through this. And then all of the different specialists that will see you, nobody's at the top, 
nobody's at the bottom. Everybody's working together to help you to address the cauda equina symptoms, to try and address this disease and continue fighting this disease. And if you need help from a physical therapist, you'll reach out to them. If it's the neurologist or the urologist, everybody is a specialist in their particular area. I even include the clinical scientists because as we learn more research and we learn more ways to treat this, there are gonna be ways to get involved in that and the clinical scientists are going to be key in that. These next two slides, I want to add, I, I put up here just to show the individual nature of care. And these are some analyses that were done looking at pain and different medications. This uses something called tricyclic. And the next one is using another type of medication that we'll go through. And this looks at does the medication or doesn't it work in across multiple clinical trials, a lot of clinical trials saying how it works. And what you see by those bar lines that are all over the place, you see that every study has its own little response rate. Patients did better from one study to the next. There's no medication that is the single best medication for any one med for all patients. Everybody is their own, uh, has to identify what medication is the best for them. This is that same instead of tri uh, tricyclics, it's looking pregabalin or Lyrica, and it's showing the variability in the response depending upon which study you're going to look at. So again, when we get back to this and we talk about the importance of fighting it with this really multidisciplinary care where the neurologist, the primary care, and the urologist are involved in prescribing medications, we've got to figure out what is the best combination for you. That last slide showed you that not everybody responds to every medication, but if you keep trying, you may find a medication that you're going to respond to. In the meantime, you need to work with the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, social worker, community support, psychology. All these people are trying to address other ways to help you manage the disease and improve your function. So with that, I wanna thank you for letting me talk to you about this. I know it was sort of a rehashing of what we had yesterday. Uh, but I hope I've given you an understanding of the compressive versus the non-compressive. And then most importantly, in the, these last five to six minutes, I wanted to focus on the importance of individualized care, the importance of developing a treatment program that's going to be best for you to address your cauda equina and improve your quality of life. So again, thank you for uh, staying for this talk.